The Big Friendly Giant by Roald Dahl Buenos dias and welcome back to Radiant Whispers. It's beautiful to have you here. Today it's all sheer fun and wild imagination with the big and spiky Roald Dahl, surely one of the most beloved writers of all time, and rightly so. Who hasn't been thrilled, amused, and delighted by his strange and wonderful stories? They're just so quirky, vibrant, and delightful that they stand on a class of their own. Dali is one of those geniuses that are so ahead of the game that everybody else, Hollywood included, is out of breath trying to catch up with them. Roald Dahl is a true original. Rather than trying to fit into the mold of the great children's writers of his culture and his time, titans like Enid Blyton, Roger Kipling, C.S. Lewis, three consummate masters of the craft in the English language, he went completely outside the box, and in doing so, created whole new landscapes and characters that are simply priceless. His playful attitude to language is another great virtue. Just consider the names of the characters in today's chosen text, The Big Friendly Giant. Dahl presents us with a section at the beginning of his book with a legend. The characters in this book are... Humans, uh, the Queen of England, Mary, the Queen's maid, Mr. Tibbs, the palace butler, the head of the army, the head of the air force, and, of course, Sophie, an orphan. So far, so good. But then come the beautiful names of the giants, and Dal is off to another planet. Giants, the flesh lump eater, the bone cruncher. The man hugger, the child chewer, the meat dripper, the gizzard gulper, the maid masher, the blood butler, the butcher boy, and of course, the big friendly giant. You're not even started, and you're already thinking, gosh, I want to read this book. I want to see the adventures of the child chewer and the meat draper and the flesh lump eater and the blood butler. Fantastic names. Fantastic names. That's how beautiful a writer Roald Dahl is. You must have read or seen the movie and or theater adaptations of The Gremlins, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, James and the Giant Peach, Fantastic Mr. Fox, Matilda, and of course, the Big Friendly Giant. Among the stories yet to be turned into the stage or the screen, my personal favorites will forever be The Witches, The Twits, and The Giraffe and the Pelly and Me. But Dahl also wrote fantabulous tones of autobiography, and he lived a rich and fruitful life as a soldier, pilot, survivor, diplomat, spy, writer, inventor, devoted husband to a Hollywood beauty, and dedicated father to his many children. So you must also read Boy, Tales of Childhood, and Going Solo. But the book we read together today is The Big Friendly Giant. And yes, the book is infinitely better than the film even if a prominent director like Steven Spielberg made the film. The Witching Hour Sophie couldn't sleep. A brilliant moonbeam was slanting through a gap in the curtains. It was shining right onto her pillow. The other children in the dormitory had been asleep for hours. Sophie closed her eyes and lay quite still. She tried very hard to doze off. It was no good. 
the moonbeam was like a silver blade slicing through the room onto her face. The house was absolutely silent. No voices came up from downstairs. There were no footsteps on the floor above either. The window behind the curtain was wide open, but nobody was walking on the pavement outside. No cars went by on the street. Not the teeniest sound could be heard anywhere. Sophie had never known such a silence. Perhaps she told herself this was what they called the witching hour. The witching hour, somebody had once whispered to her, was a special moment in the middle of the night when every child and every grown-up was in a deep, deep sleep. And all the dark things came out from hiding and had the world to themselves. The moonbeam was brighter than ever on Sophie's pillow. She decided to get out of bed and close the gap in the curtains. You got punished if you were caught out of bed after lights out. Even if you said you had to go to the lavatory, that was not accepted as an excuse and they punished you just the same. But there was no one about now. Sophie was sure of that. She reached out for her glasses that lay on the chair beside her bed. They had steel rims and very thick lenses, and she could hardly see a thing without them. She put them on. Then she slipped out of bed and tiptoed over to the window. When she reached the curtains, Sophie hesitated. She longed to duck underneath them and lean out of the window to see what the world looked like now that the witching hour was at hand. She listened again. Everywhere it was deathly still. The longing to look out became so strong she couldn't resist it. Quickly she ducked under the curtains and leaned out of the window. In the silvery moonlight, The village street she knew so well seemed completely different. The houses looked bent and crooked like houses in a fairy tale. Everything was pale and ghostly and milky white. Across the road she could see Mrs. Rance's shop, where you bought buttons and wool and bits of elastic. It didn't look real. There was something dim and misty about that, too. Sophie allowed her eye to travel further and further down the street. Suddenly, she froze. There was something coming up the street on the opposite side. It it was something black, something tall and black, something very tall and very black and very thin. Chapter 2. Who? It wasn't a human. It couldn't be. It was four times as tall as the tallest human. It was so tall its head was higher than the upstairs windows of the houses. Sophie opened her mouth to scream, but no sound came out. Her throat, like her whole body, was frozen with fright. This was the witching hour, all right. The tall black figure was coming her way. It was keeping very close to the houses across the street, hiding in the shadowy places where there was no moonlight. On and on it came nearer and nearer, but it was moving in spurts. It would stop, then it would move on, then it would stop again. What on earth was it doing? Aha! Sophie could see now what it was up to. It was stooping in front of each house. It would stop and peer into the upstairs window of each house in the street. It actually had to bend down to peer into the upstairs windows. That's how tall it was. It would stop and peer in. Then it would slide on to the next house and stop again and peer in and so on along the street. 
It was much closer now, and Sophie could see it more clearly. Looking at it carefully, she decided it had to be some kind of person. Obviously, it was not a human, but it was definitely a person, a giant person, perhaps. Sophie stared hard across the misty, moonlit street. The giant, if that was what he was, was wearing a long black cloak. In one hand, he was holding what looked like a very long, thin trumpet. In the other hand, he held a large suitcase. The giant had stopped now right in front of Mr. and Mrs. Gucci's house. The Gucci's had a greengrocer's shop in the middle of the high street, and the family lived above the shop. The two Gucci children slept in the upstairs front room. Sophie knew that. The giant was peering through the window into the room where Michael and Jane Gucci were sleeping. From across the street, Sophie watched and held her breath. She saw the giant step back a pace and put the suitcase down on the pavement. He bent over and opened the suitcase. He took something out of it. It looked like a glass jar. One of those square ones with a screw top? He unscrewed the top of the jar and poured what was in it into the end of the long trumpet thing. Sophie watched, trembling. She saw the giant straighten up again, and she saw him poke the trumpet in through the open upstairs window of the room where the Gucci children were sleeping. She saw the giant take a deep breath, and woof, he blew through the trumpet. No noise came out, but it was obvious to Sophie that whatever had been in the jar had now been blown through the trumpet into the Gucci children's bedroom. What could it be? As the giant withdrew the trumpet from the window and bent down to pick up the suitcase, he happened to turn his head and glance across the street. In the moonlight, Sophie caught a glimpse of an enormous, long, pale, wrinkly face with the most enormous ears. The nose was as sharp as a knife, and above the nose there were two bright, flashing eyes, and the eyes were staring straight at Sophie. There was a fierce and devilish look about them. Sophie gave a yelp and pulled back from the window. She flew across the dormitory and jumped into her bed and hid under the blanket. And there she crouched, still as a mouse, and tingling all over. <laughs> so what do you think? Isn't this a story you would like to read? Of course. I'm sorry I cannot read you more due to legal reasons, though how I would love to be able to record the whole text and the whole of Roald Dahl's works. They're just phenomenal. And if you know anyone in the audiobooks industry who are creative and revolutionary, why don't you tell them, hey, you must get this Mexican guy to read Roald Dahl. You know, that's a nice, quirky, different kind of idea. Yeah, just put a word in. All right, who knows? History may thank you. Certainly, I will. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, and by the way, don't worry about Sophie. The story has a happy end, a very happy end, of course. Sophie is just about to fall into the safest hands. Far from being in danger... She's about to embark in a great friendship and a thrilling adventure that will transform her hundred life. Can I repeat that, as always, the book is much better than the film, and the real Sophie, the one in the book, is much more likable and genuine than the self-opinionated, argumentative, and overbearing little missy in the film. <sighs> But that's what Hollywood does to so many good books in the name of political 
correctness. So go and read the rest of this beautiful adventure. Roald Dahl is always a good choice. Thank you for listening. You know the drill. If you liked it, be a big friendly giant and click on the like button. Subscribe and share with your nearest and dearest friendly giants. Hey, you could even leave me a message here, a comment. Or at radiantwhispers.com. Thank you.